All right, welcome everyone to today's community question roundup with Ramesh Gulati and me, myself, Brian Jan. We're gonna be making this podcast for people who wanna learn all things about maintenance and reliability. And in today's episode, we're gonna be reviewing some of the questions submitted by our members in our maintenance community Slack group. We'll hear insights from one of our maintenance experts and residents, the reliability Sherpa himself, Ramesh Gulati. Thanks. Super excited to have you. Thanks. <laughs> Just as a brief introduction here, the maintenance community Slack group is an awesome place for people to maintenance and reliability to ask questions and learn from over 4,500 professionals all around the world. If you haven't already, you can join the maintenance community Slack group at upkeep.org slash Slack. Today, Ramesh and I are super excited to do a deep dive into real questions asked by some of the community members here in the Slack group. What I love so much about the, the maintenance community Slack group is that the topics span from high level questions all the way to ground level problem solving. And I'm super excited to dig in and hear some of your takes, Ramesh, into these you know, real life questions submitted by our community members. So again, these questions were sourced by our community from our community. And we tried to take all the different questions and narrow them down into the, some of the best questions that, that we thought you might have, Ramesh, a particular insight into. And so the first question was actually asked by someone in our community named Philip. He was asking about the most popular, but the worst maintenance KPI and why. Yeah, um, something that he mentioned was that schedule compliance, uh, because there's so many different variables that affect the schedule, schedule compliance can be in its own field with individual KPIs reflecting the different aspects that can affect the final compliance. What are your thoughts, Ramesh? Let me answer this question two parts. You know, KPIs, you know, whenever we do some task or, or a whole, we have objective or something we want to meet, we try to see how we are doing it. So to measure that performance, we created this metrics we call, or some of the key ones, vital ones, we call them KPIs, okay? Really KPIs are to look how we are doing it. And if we are not meeting the, getting to the goal or our objective, then how, what we need to be doing different or make a changes in our process and our, you know, what our practices we are doing it so we can make, we can reach to goal. Okay, that's what all, that's what these metrics are. Again, metrics should be to change our behavior, to right. do the right practices, not cheat or do something to just show that, yeah, we are doing it. I think, we have to be honest when we are developing or trying to implement some of these metrics, okay? It's not simple. Many times we want to do a good job, but then the management practices, some external forces or something make us to reach quickly or don't or show them something is good happening, which may not be happening. So that's kind of a bad thing about it, okay? Now, schedule compliance. It's a great metric. I love it. I have used it many times, but you have to be honest. Schedule compliance, we want to know when we send our people to do maintenance. When they go there, the, everything is ready to be worked on. The machine is down, already to be taken care. Parts are there. Whatever we need, all the resources are there. So we get our job done quickly, more effectively, efficiently. Okay? That's the whole purpose. Now, if we don't, you know, if things are not ready, any reason that the delays are there, and that's a schedule compliance will tell us that our we did not meet the schedule, the machine was not ready or not given to us, all these kind of things, or our spare parts was not there, or whatever. Schedule compliance. Now, if we want to cheat, yes, we can cheat. Means. What we'll do is we'll don't schedule large projects, a problem, we'll have problem, and those kind of, we'll try to put those projects or tasks which are easier to do. Then it's a cheating. Yes, we'll, the metrics give us a wrong answer, okay? Mm. That's not good, okay? Now, if you don't cheat, now suppose there is a problem, let's find out what are the causes, why this, metric is not doing it. We're supposed to be 70% compliance or 80%, really 90 is a benchmark somewhere 90, 95%. Now, if we're not there, we are running only 60, 
70%. Let's find out why. You know, what are the reason we are not meeting there? You know, let's find out what's our causes and find, correct those causes, take some action. But now if we just providing a lip service, yeah, we try to somehow cheat, put just a task or projects to do, which are easier to do. And so we are showing 90% schedule compliance or something. I think Philip said you're right. I say very, very challenging. It's yeah. not, I mean, like that's to me is a great metric. Every metric is a good metric, but how do you look at it? How do you try to make compliance with that? You know, that's my concern. Yeah, I think something that I, I kind of subscribe to or philosophy that I subscribe to uh, around KPIs tracking and measuring is like there's there's kind of like two two kinds right there's lagging KPIs there's leading KPIs and the way that I kind of define them is you've got like KPIs that help support like your inputs your actions what you're doing and then you have KPIs that track and measure the outcome the output you know the the actual end purpose of of what we're trying to achieve and maybe to this point around like maintenance KPIs, maybe even schedule compliance. To your point, Ramesh, it's not a bad KPI to track. It's kind of one of these uh, leading indicators. Yes. Um, and it's good to measure it. Yeah. But in order to, what you actually care about, probably most likely is you care about more, you know, uptime and reducing downtime of your equipment. It's a good leading in indicator and it's good to track and measure, but as a KPI to like set goals and even compensation around, it might not be the best one because to your point, Ramesh, it is so easy to gain and cheat. We got another question from Iridi. He asked, is it possible for a maintenance planner to work remotely away from the plant if the CMS is a web-based solution? I, I, think, I think where this question's coming from is, we saw a big surge of people and more people working from home as a, as a result of COVID. So I think where this, this question is coming from is, you know, I think generally this role has been sitting in the plant next to all the maintenance, you know, guys and gals, but now because of COVID, we're seeing more people have the opportunity to work from home. And I think this is a great question, something that's very, very like present day timely do you think that it is possible to work not just away from the plant, but also do it effectively as a maintenance planner or maintenance scheduler? Yes, it's possible. Really, we have to think. Let's think, talk about who is a planner. Who could be a good planner? A good planner, the key attributes of a good planner in my mind, this person should be an experienced ex-technician. Okay? The person who has done those jobs, and has aptitude to, for details, can understand the drawings. He's a good communicator. These are kind of things a good planner should have. Now, objective of planner is to prepare a job package. Job package which has all the information required to complete the job. Means it has listed what's a job task and how we're gonna do it, the sequence, what kind of resources we need, what kind of material we need, what kind of crane or anything we need, all those things are listed out. And if there's any sketches, drawings, all are there, okay? So to me, yes, it could be done at anywhere, but as long as the job pack is done properly with all the details is, okay? Maybe another question here, Ramesh, is do you think that they can do the job effectively? I mean, maybe I'll, I'll uh, opine here a little bit. I, I personally think that having your, your physical presence there is actually very important. Being able to stand next to the equipment, being able to see what parts are in the storeroom, being able to talk face to face and look at the equipment in, in the production floor. I'd imagine that's that's so critical, even to a maintenance planner, even as you're thinking about, you know, in the next two, next three, next you know, four weeks ahead is still really important. Do you think yes. the job effective? You're right. You're right. I think if, if I'm planning for something, I need to see the equipment, what equipment I'm going, what kind of things are there. So I may have to go there, yeah. you know, look aside or talk up, or even when job is planned, I don't have to, but I, again, my own interest, I'll go 
talk to technician. Hey, is the job package I gave you, is everything right? Is you, did you need any extra tool or something which I didn't put it or something to check how my schedule planning was done? I think interface is important, but majority of the work could be done at offsite. Got Maybe twenty percent time could be on the site or something, you know. So yes, there's some time it will be much better face to face, you know. Yeah. Maybe fifty twenty percent, but majority of job could be done not right at that site, but a little bit different place. It could be. Right, I, I agree, and I, I think that this might be uh, more of a trend in the future, you know, enabling That's people. Right. To work remotely for a portion of their job and come on site when they need to. Um, and that gives people the, the flexibility to, to work, you know, at home and not have to deal with hours of traffic. Yeah. Uh, and also have better concentration. We, we've seen a lot of our customers have that capability when they're, they're working from home, actually. So, all right. Next question that we had came from Vinod. He asked, how do you calculate the replacement asset value? Obviously, there are a lot of different ways. What's the most common? What, what method do you generally recommend to, to other companies? Okay. Now, how do I find out what's my replacement value? Because if I something happens that equipment burned down or something, and I have to replace it, how much that's going to cost me? That's what I want to find out. Now, so I need to do is go in the industry, find out how much that equipment is costing. Now, they have, we need to put a process together. We identify these equipment, and it was kind of a all system manager who was responsible. They will go back, they put on a, in a, in a calendar that every five years, that asset, they're going to find out how much is going to, what is the current cost is to get that from. So they'll go to vendor, find out, hey, give me the cost. That million dollar, which was five years, now maybe $1.3 million or something, okay? Now, also we said in the, that replacement cost should be, how much is gonna cost you to replace the old equipment out? If it mm -hmm. got burned down or something, you have to remove it. Somebody, that's gonna cost money. Then yeah. we had to put this million, three dollar or whatever cost is put that equipment down. That's going to cost something. So all this cost has to be, that's a replacement value. Yeah. Okay. So we asked our system manager on a, that put in your system that every two years, three years or four years, you will come back and get this cost. And for next three, two, three years, you're going to use inflation factor. So if today I got some cost, that's of $2 million, Next year is going to be two point, whatever my inflation rate is, 2% or 3%, 5%. And I'm going to do that for the next two, three, four years till I go back and connect that cost to the actual cost. Okay, this way I'm in a ballpark figure, how much is replacement value is. So basically what, what I heard from you is that you might start with the, the book value, the, the depreciated value, but then you throw in a factor around inflation and also you add in all the costs to, to... No, book value is there, but that's not correct value. I have okay. to go to the market, find out how much that asset is going to cost me today. And suppose it costs me $2, $2 million. That's why today, 2020, 2022, 2021. 2022, I'm going to add an inflation factor for 21. It'll be times one point... Uh, 2% or 3%, 5%, something like that, whatever the standard is. Then 23 will be something. 20 In 24 or 25, I'll go back to market, find out what the real cost is. And then they'll do the calculation, put that number again. You know, I try to adjust every year so that I'm in a ballpark. And then every, depending upon how many assets I got, I may do that real, going to the market, finding out how much is, you know, every three to five years, something like that. And th this is actually such a good question coming from Vinoth, because I think a lot of people, I would say the easiest way of doing it is kind of using the book value. And, and to your point, Ramesh, I, I think what happens when you use the book value is you're drastically underestimating That's you know, right. how much it actually costs to replace that equipment. There's no way that you can just purchase a you know, five-year-old million dollar asset I'll give you a good example. We were doing a repair in, we had a small lake. We had a dam. 
It was built back in 50s. And its book value was showing quarter million dollar. To repair one damn door, it costed a half a million dollar. You know, so you cannot take their book value. I mean, just to repair one door on the dam cost a half a million dollar. The bare whole dam cost back in 50s was maybe several million dollars by, you know, 50, 60 years later, the book value was only a quarter million dollar. The, the next question was, was submitted by you know, two, two of our, or one member, and we had some comments from two of our members in our group. There was this conversation around how do you manage firefighting while also trying to collect the data to track KPIs? So it's you know, kind of like the, the juggling act of responding to the critical needs of the business today, while also wanting to think, plan long-term and strategically, looking at, you know, let's call it like KPIs, the metrics, collecting data. They mentioned to make sure that you're getting jobs, work orders done, completed for every single job, even for emergencies. And so I think what, what they're trying to highlight is, you know, you, you kind of have to do both. Like don't sacrifice the short term for the long term. Don't sacrifice the long term for, for the short term too. Any, any thoughts there, Ramesh? How do you balance this? Again, a great question. It really tells us about real situation because when I look at the numbers at US and North America, we are talking, oh, worldwide, we are still talking 50, 60% reactive work. Yeah. Most organizations are, which is fire fighting mode all the time. And to do a good job, we need to have a good data. Trying to get it, it's always a fight. And when we talk to our technicians or talk to people, hey, we want data all filled out. And they say, oh, I'm busy in doing this repair. And when they're busy, they don't want to do much work. And that's a challenge, I understand. But we have to collect good quality data. Otherwise, we cannot do improvements, okay? So we have to find what's happening and getting a quality data is a challenge. Yeah. Now, again, other side is you are CMMS guy. What work order data is important to me? If I take a work order and ask in my class, many people, what data we want? If I work order, it has a, maybe 10 or 12 data elements. Which one is the most important I need to have it? Hardly anybody says, hey, we need to have an asset number. Asset number is the most important. If I don't have asset right number, that data, whatever I put is going to hang up somewhere. Yeah. It's not going to write part. So we have to select or tell, hey, these are the five or six important data element I need to have. Second thing, how we can make data input easier. To me, CMMS system has a two component. CMMS is just in my mind, again, you are a guy, big gun there. CMMS is a data repository. It has input and output. Input is this work order data, how you want to put in the system quickly, easily. Mm -hmm. You know, my dead technician with a one button can put all these 10 points right there, wherever they have to go. If I go to six screen, used to be that way 30, 40 years ago, to get a work order 10 data point, I may have to go six screen, you know, put something there, then go to next, put something there, put something there. And by the time I've done all these 10 data points, I've gone to six, seven screens. Technician not going to do that. They may do one time, two times, three times. Let's make it easier for our technicians. And I told my IT babas, hey, I want this. It's been 10 years. Still, I didn't get it. Of course, I'm not there now. But that's the way we have to think how we can make our technician job easier to get data in. Yeah. Okay. Once the data got in, then there's another problem. How get information out? Yeah, the knowledge out so we can make a better decision. Yeah. I mean, th this is a, a really good question because it's 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 very real. It's coming from on the ground. And yes. I think oftentimes what we hear from our customers and people in the industry is, hey, look, would you rather me spend two hours inputting data or two yeah. more hours repairing, you know, and doing jobs? In fact, we have to also, it's not just technology. We have to educate our people. 
Exactly. And yeah. Especially if you got uh, some old timers like me, and they're scared of inputting your data. So literally what we had to do was we have to assign a support person to that area, okay? This person's job was you spend two hours or three hours every day there helping this technician. They will, he will review or she will review the data. It's not complete. He'll go and ask the technician, hey, come here. Maybe he was helping them to put the input the data in properly with a not completed fix. No, we want a lot more detail, quality data in. You know what you did, all details, you know. So yes, we did that for over almost year, two years, year, year and a half. And that helped those technicians to learn in a hands-on kind of a training. And that really helped to get the data quality improved. The next question comes from Lewis from our community. Lewis asks, why is it so difficult for companies to go from deterministic to probabilistic data analysis. Any thoughts around that? Again, this is a more reliability modeling type of question. Deterministic model or output model, which are fully determined by the parameter values and initial. Where probabilistic model incorporates randomness, it's a more random. Deterministic is more is that you have a better output or pretty accurate results. Like if I put some money in a bank, I know how much I got, how much interest I'm going to get, so I can predict really good to accurate how much I'm going to get a year from now or something, okay? That's it. Where probabilistic is a more reliability, that's what we use probability failure. It's, a, it's like a putting a, throwing dice. If I put a dice, if three comes out, I know probability of getting three again is one six. You know, three is a one number out of six, you know, so one six. It's a more probabilistic case. Again, is a more probability or deterministic is a give you better results where probabilistic it kind of gives you a really, it takes all other variables out in it, okay? So I don't know why, but in reliability, we use probability. We want to measure what's our failure rate is, then try to estimate what's our probability of failure, reliability would be. So we are using a lot probability kind of theory in our reliability, that's it, okay? So yes, people want to exact, yeah, deterministic models kind of give you a good accurate results, but it may not be true all the time, you know? I think what, what I hear from you, Ramesh, is that it determines on the application here. Sure. You know, whether you use a deterministic or a probabilist, probabilistic um, analysis, it really depends on what you're trying to apply this to. And in some cases, it does make sense. In some cases, it, it may not. You know, maybe yeah. from an even time and resource per, perspective. Yeah, sure. yeah, people, again, they like to know exactly, and that's the reason many organizations, many managers like to deterministic, hey, your variables not that much. You can, with the one or two variables, you can predict something. But yes, but many times that may not be applied to all your applications. Yeah, that's right. All right, another community member, um, Joe, he asked, what are the different barriers and limitations of UAV systems in remote inspections? Every other technology, new technology you try to use, you have limitations. Depends upon what you're buying, what capabilities are. Yeah, UV, UAVs are, again, for maintenance, we started using UAVs for the roof inspections. Yeah. That was a, a most common roof inspection. Then came outside structure. Yeah. You know, what's there? You know, it's, applications are growing. Of course, we have a bigger, job we are doing in the military and other applications, but in the industry is now, they are being used in a lot of different places. Again, depends upon what your application is, and you have to see a, what your capability or capacity is, a how what kind of camera on it, you know, what you're trying to do based on those who will depend. Oh, and also you have to have a, some local 
regulation that you cannot do this or you cannot do this. I think you have to evaluate those things what they are. To me, again, limitation based on what you want to do, what's the capability that UAV is. That's a limitation would be. Yeah, and kind of my take here for, for a community member, Joe, I think personally, the rewards of this, the opportunities of UAVs is, is incredibly massive in terms of reducing risk, improving the, the safety as well, getting it into places that people we, we uh, physically cannot. I mean, I'm, I'm personally very, very excited about um, UAVs in remote inspections. Especially in, a, yeah, you said hazardous, hazardous area, where tanks where you cannot go, where you can send something. I mean, a lot of people could be done with the UAVs, but most of applications are going for you know, looking your structure, you know, bridges. Like when you tell see I-40, they crack on a bridge. Yeah. And if they would have done a good job in a UAV all around, and structure taking picture, they would have found out, you know. So some of the, you have to see the application, what those are. Again, capabilities of cameras, accessibility, all those kind of things, you know. So those will be the limitation, you know, so. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing really, really interesting um, applications of UAV and thermal. You're seeing, obviously, camera is one of them. And it's actually starting to become even more interesting because uh, on on UAVs, I think the the types of different sensing abilities from these That's UAVs right. yep. may, sense. you know, I think are going to quickly outstrip what a human can do. That's um, right. yep. So we talk about like barriers and limitations. Yes, there there are a few. It depends on what your application is, whether you need to feel something, hear something. You need to, you know, it could be even smell. But I think what we're going to find is that these UAV systems are just going to be accelerated in terms of what they can sense, what they can feel. Um, well, okay, they have become much cheaper and new technology is a new better cameras are coming, new sensing devices are coming. So those kind of thing in putting on those in a UAV is going to make job much easier and more affordable, you know. So that's, I think, is going to grow. That market is going to grow. Yeah. And maybe, maybe the, to the question here, like what are some of the barriers and limitations? I, I think one of the biggest limitations and why I, I believe and you know, I think we both believe that people are still critically important is because you know, these UAV systems can run inspections fine. That's great, but they can't, not right now at least, repair. That's uh, right, yep. You know, yes, you can sense. Yes, you can remotely condition monitor things but you can't repair. So the action is a barrier to some of this. That's right. Um, I, actually, you cannot, they are, cannot repair it. They can do the inspection, tell us, hey, there's a problem there. Then to confirm that, still we have to send somebody to confirm it and then put a repair plan together for that. Right, exactly. And I also think the, the analysis component too is largely still done by, by people. Yeah. All right, great question though. So our next question comes from Renee. Renee asked, in my plant, I have 60 controllers for motors. I want to know the probability of failure. What tool should I use? Is there a simple answer here? <laughs> well, again, I'm going to as um, first question, I'm going to ask this person, Renee, that 60 controllers are the PLC, are the same kind, or the same model, or they're different kind. You know, one of the problem I found when I go to different places like PLC and this company standardized four models, but they got 10 models. And when I went there about a year ago, this place, they said they were showing me, look at that. I got this new equipment. This is my 11th PLC type. Now I have to train people for this PLC also. Okay. So that's another challenge is how we standardize those things. Now, to come to the question, I have a 60 controller, 60 different kind of motor, whatever. Okay. I need to find out are they the same kind or different model. I can group them in one or put them in smaller, you know, different kind of models, whatever they have. Then really I have to find 
what's my mean time between failure is for those. I have to look at the history, you know, what happened last one year or two years, how many failures happened, try to find what's my failure rate is, what's my MTBF is. Then I have to reliably model it. You know, I can use, you know, a, a, I have to assume also constant failure rate, flat curve, the bad curve curve, and use binomial or exponential distribution binomial. Hey, what will happen if I want to have zero failure or one failure or two failure, what's my probability of failure? So really is that uh, depends upon what kind of a controller they have, same time model, and what kind of data they have on that. They need to find out what really what's the failure rate is and then use one of the probability or reliability model equations to find out what's their failure rate would be for zero failure, one failure, two failure, or how they can improve it. Yeah. I think what I gather from, from what you just said, Ramesh, is it all sta starts with the data, the history. Um, That's right. Taking, take, taking the data, the history, you can look at mean time between failures. Um, if you can group these controllers into make, model, age, you can use all of these data points to help tell, you know, and create a, a probability of failure. But I, it doesn't sound like there's a single tool that you should use no, or no. single solution. No, no. That it's not use. that, hey, I got 60 controller, put in there this tool and gives me answer. No, you have yeah. to do a little bit more work. Yeah, that's right. right. <laughs> we, we have another question from Vinod again. He also asked, has anyone developed maintenance strategies for fiber reinforced pipelines? FRP process columns, cemented pipelines, non-metallic pipelines. Is there anything I should keep in mind or resources I should look up? This is a very, very like nuanced question here or a very specific <laughs> well, question. <laughs> I don't know anybody has done this, but to me for this specific application, but in general, what I can suggest to him to come up a maintenance strategy for any asset, okay? These are pipes, different kind of pipes. So really we have to think how they can fail, how this asset can fail, okay? I have to do failure mode and effect analysis, FMEA on this, okay? I would suggest to him that try to get people, few people who are, have worked in this area, get them in a room, operator, maintainer, and try to do FMEA try to find how this pipe, whose function is to flow something in it, some fluid, some kind of fluid, what our fluid is, flow in it, so minimize the leakage, that's what we want. That's the purpose of this pipe, are where they, in what environment they are. So based on that condition, try to find how it can fail, okay? Over pressure, low pressure, or, you know, some earthquake or whatever, how it can fail. And then how we can minimize it. What kind of maintenance we need to be doing it. What kind of data we should be collecting. To me, again, I don't know the detail, but again, I think he needs to do is a, try to do a FMEA on that pipes or different kind of cement pipe or this pipe or fiber reinforced pipe, different kind of pipes. and try to see what, how they can fail the, defeat the purpose or function of that, you know, system. Right. That's what I can, you know, so suggest him to do it, you know. Yeah, so so maybe no, no direct resources for fiber reinforced pipelines, but it sounds like the strategy around developing maintenance strategies it's kind of consistent, whether it's a pipe, whether it's a motor uh, yeah. or anything else. You start with the same. Action. FMEA and yeah. you, you do the, the the analysis on the different ways that your equipment can fail and find mitigation areas. You know, th this is actually a, a great segue into the next question here, which is all around lub lubrication strategies, which again might come out of, a, you know, might be a result of running an F FMEA. Yeah. But John within our community asked, do you have any recommendations on how to learn to establish a lubricant strategy at, at your plant? Well, it's easy. Go to school, learn, get, this, get some training. 
But again, it's more than that. I think, well, I would suggest him to attend a school or something, attend it. There's a lot of training on lubrication, but really is what he has to do is what kind of lubricants they are using in their facility, okay? You know, can you standardize them? You may be using 10 times of oil. Can you standardize the four or five? Okay, talking to vendors, supplier, machine, hey, can we standardize or greases? How clean is your oil? You know, is that, how is a incoming oil? My experience over the years is incoming oil, 60% of our incoming oil was bad. You know, what kind of standard you're using? There's ISO standard 4406, which tells, and you have to, for different type of asset, gearboxes, this and that, you know, so you use, come up with what kind of quality of oil you want. There should be a two digit, 15, 10, 12, these are two digit, three digit. That's the way you try to come up the quality of a lubricant, you know, how good that lubricant is, you know. So think about that. Then how you're storing the lubricant, distributing it. You know, you can get contamination when you're distributing it, you're storing it. You have to look that. You need to have some kind of a lubricant contamination, contamination program. You know, how you're going to remove contamination in your process. So these are four, four or five things I was going to suggest him. Does he have my book? Read my book. There's about three chapters there, half a chapter, at least to give you some idea to what to do next, okay? If he doesn't have, get that book and uh, at least give him, there's about few pages there, you know, so that's it. All right. Thank you, Ramesh, for sharing all these awesome resources amongst our, our listeners, including everything from lubrication to running FMEAs at your plant and facility. So this actually concludes our chapter for, for today and our conversation for today. Um, Ramesh, thank you so much for taking the time to answer some of the questions from our community members. Really appreciate it. I know our community does too. If any of our listeners would, would like to receive answers to their questions, um, anything maintenance, reliability, or anything else, you can feel free to join our Slack community at upkeep.org. There you can receive live answers from fellow members, hear from Ramesh himself uh, in our monthly roundup. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it you inviting me to do this. And uh, if I can help anyone, it would be a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ramesh, for being so generous with your time again. My name is Ryan. I'm the CEO and founder of Upkeep, and I hope to talk to you next time. Thanks. <laughs>